Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short, is an inclusive and neutral platform for informed conversation, intellectual dialogue, exchange of ideas, and the arts. Evening session is Black Ambassadors of Politics, Religion, and Jazz in India, Afro-South Asia in the Global African Diaspora. We have with us this evening uh, jazz guitarist and archival historian Sushil Korean, uh, who will be in conversation with uh, the person who has put this series together. This is the second of the series, uh, Dr. Kenneth X. Robbins, who will also be in conversation with John Sachmo Manan, professor of the American experience at the College of New Rochelle. Many Black American and African lives have mattered to the world because their interactions with South Asians have furthered the causes of political liberation, spiritual liberation, and musical liberation. They range from global pan-Africanists to the mentors of Martin Luther King Jr., who met with Mahatma Gandhi. The global import of Afro-diasporic music is seen throughout South Asia, and jazz musicians have been greatly influenced by South Asian religions. Session will have two presentations. The first presentation is by Sushil Kurian, uh, and it is titled Black, Brown, and White How Pre Independent India Informed Afro American Jazz Men. Pre Independent India of the 1930s was an attractive destination for African American jazz musicians. They spent considerable amounts of time working in India, and their interactions with and, and observations of life around them have a unique perspective. In this talk, so she will share some of their first-hand observations and opinions of uh, the India they encountered. The second presentation by Kenneth X. Robbins is titled The Sound Universe, from Maharaja Sahaja Rao III and Hazrat Inayat Khan to John and Alice Coltrane. The musician Sufi Inayat Khan, born into a family of musicians supported by a Maharaja, came to the West. His view of the universe sound influenced the spiritual search of jazz musicians like John Coltrane. Coltrane's widow, the pianist harpist Alice Coltrane, became a guru herself. The discussant will be Professor John Sachmo Manan, who is a well who is a well-known vocalist, saxophonist, and promoter of the jazz tradition. And uh, the full bios of all the speakers will appear in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please feel free to use the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your Zoom screen, to post questions uh, to the speakers, and they will be addressed towards the end of the session. And with that, uh, over to Dr. Robbins. Thank you very much. Uh, the book that we have produced is a little bit different, because the book is to uh, to really discuss blacks across the globe. Now, what we started with was uh, what we started with was with several volumes. Now, the first volume that we discussed with you is the accomplishments of blacks in India. The usual way of doing this is to talk about slavery and talk about poor black communities. That's not the way in which I wanted to go. I wanted to emphasize first the accomplishments of blacks uh, in, in India, and then to move with this volume to discuss the agency of blacks from Africa, and more importantly, from India, from uh, America to India. So we started talking about the various American black missionaries who came to India. And there were some of the most important ones as well. There were a number of African Americans who made contact with Gandhi. And there was, of course, W.E. Du Bois, who had a strong sense of an anti imperialist network of colored people. And so we discussed his relationship with M. Bedkar. But most of the book has focused on music and particularly on jazz. And what we found was that there was agency of black people and that 
they interface with music. So on the one hand, we started talking about uh, all these uh, missionaries who came in terms of Christianity, but then we went on to talking about Dizzy Gillespie, American jazz uh, ambassador to South Asia and uh, elsewhere, who became a leading light of the Baha'i movement. And uh, then we went on to talk about how these people functioned in a secular context, and then in terms of Islam and the Hindu religion. So I'd like to focus now on the early accomplishments, and I'm going to turn it off with the Sashil. Sashil? Yeah, hi, uh, every, uh, good evening, everybody. First, uh, I want to correct my bio. I am a jazz guitarist in perpetual learning, and anyone who plays jazz knows that you never become what you think you're going to be. You spend your whole life learning and working at it. So with that correction, I'll add, uh, yes, I am a guitarist, but I am in perpetual learning, and that's the way it is, and that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> so having said that, let me uh, make sure I can share that screen, and uh, good, 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 good. So. Uh, this conversation is really titled, uh, uh, you know, really focuses on pre-independent India and not only how India was in kind of benefited or, or saw the results of these African-American jazzmen who came there, but uh, how it also informed them and some of their takeaways. So I will go into it really quickly. So what we're going to talk about today is a historical arc that's a specific period really from, for this talk from 1920s, from the early 1920s to the late 40s actually, Inde independent India was kind of the cutoff for this, this cycle that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, and I'll introduce some characters to you, some of whom you probably already know because there's been a lot of work done by uh, other people and myself. I'm gonna to try to shed some perspective from two uh, vectors, uh, one is quote unquote what I call from the outside, which is how uh, they were seen and perceived. And more interestingly, uh, a little nugget of archival information, uh, which I call the inside view, which is uh, really from the eyes and uh, viewpoint of these amazing uh, people who found themselves in India. But that's the story, so we'll get to it in a second. And we'll end with a very quick encapsulation of their significance and uh, a little touch a little bit on their place in history. So you get a better sense of who these musicians were and uh, their, their, their importance or uh, uh, the, the role they played. So let's leave it at that. So uh, I do want to point out that in this presentation, uh, you are going to see material that I consider, and a, a lot of people and should consider, racist, disrespectful, and offensive. I want to be very clear that this is not my personal belief. I'm only sharing this material in historical and archival context. So uh, again, uh, be aware that this is just historical material, and it is racist, disrespectful, and very offensive. Uh, so let's begin. So here's this photograph from uh, a vast set of archives that I accumulated uh, from about 2007 on. And when I show this to jazz guys, the first thing they say, oh, those are jazz guys, and they look like jazz guys. And it turns out that these were musicians traveling on a train, and it says Howrah 1938. And it kind of uh, always, I find it fascinating because they look just like jazz guys, you know, going somewhere or the other. And uh, it turns out they probably were shuttling between Bombay and Calcutta or going somewhere else. But it really led to uh, three important questions. A, how did the sound of jazz come to India? Uh, who were these musicians? And how did it get popularized and where did it go? Uh, so uh, having said that, uh, I'll go back into a little time uh, time travel. In 2009, I started working on a film, uh, on a story about jazz in India. It wound up turning into a film in 2011. Uh, we put the first cut together, we screened it at the United Nations, I was honored. Uh, it was the keynote film screening of the first International Jazz Day ever held by the United Nations and our film was the keynote film because uh, it was seen as bringing together the story, the universal story of jazz. Um, we've had multiple screenings in Europe, in USA, in India, in Bangalore. Actually, it just struck me that we did screen at BIC but it was at a location called Terry, T-E-R-I, 
and uh, it was a wonderful screening and I remember meeting uh, having a great conversation there so anyway so it's been screened in various places academic screenings and so on and so forth uh, uh, including a second round of screenings in Bangalore where we actually brought the musician and his band from Calcutta to a performance in Bangalore some of you may remember that uh, done other works that have kind of emanated from this vast archive that came together and uh, importantly uh, was also a keynote film and speaker at a very important conference in 2013 hosted by the Sorbonne uh, and all this leads to where we're going which really looked at the international circulation of jazz which was the first time any such event had been put together and there were people from all over the world sharing and engaging in this dissemination and global movement of this music uh, and of course uh, as Ken just pointed out uh, I also had a chance and I was honored to be able to contribute a uh, piece of writing uh, some academic uh, some co a contribution to uh, the volume on the black ambassadors of politics religion and jazz in India so let's go to history uh, what you see on your screen is a photograph of a very very early group of singers who came to India somewhere in the 1800s, the late 1800s. And their form of music was called uh, Jubilee or Gospel. Uh, and if you look at the evolution of jazz and the historical kind of thread that has brought jazz to what we think it is today, and most of us have 50, it's like seven blind men and the elephant. We have 10 different views of what we think jazz is. But whatever it is, it, it came from among its sources was this period of gospel music and the, uh, it, these singers, various groups of them actually came to India between 1849 and 1819 we have historical documented evidence of some six or eight groups that toured and these were not uh, low-level groups these were top well-known groups that traveled internationally the Fisk uh, singers uh, among others uh, there were other groups whose names kind of elude me, but then there were also minstrel shows uh, that kind of depicted the stereotypical view of what was considered African-American music of the time. Uh, they were all in India, right up to about the 1900s or so. Uh, but there was also something else going on. There was this incredible worldwide dissemination of jazz that had started, and uh, by 1922, the New York Times uh, Book Review and Magazine, uh, its journalist named Bernard Hershey, reported on his travels around Europe, Asia, Africa, the Orient, that wherever he went, and he, I hope you can read that, he says, Where, no shoot sooner had I shaken off the dust of some city and slipped out of earshot of its jazz bands than some sub sub toodle right into another I went. So what he was saying is as he traveled these cities uh, outside of the United States, he was hearing the this 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 jazz stuff and uh it's critical it's important that the way he says is everywhere he went it was at a different stage of metamorphosis it was evolving it was hard to recognize but unmistakably this is key it was an attempt at jazz and 1922 we had indian bands playing this pre-jazz this pre-armstrong music and conducted bands and there were European bands that brought Dixieland style early attempts, the Dan Hopkins Syncopators, the John Abriani Six, among others. And we also had band leaders from India and one of them was the very well-known Ken Mack. Uh, this is from his 50th anniversary celebration and he continued right into the, the 60s uh, as a band leader, you know, this evolving what was quote unquote jazz. He was, I wouldn't really call him a jazz man, but this is what was considered jazz at the time. But he was out there in 1922. Uh, and in 1926, we have the first documented recording of jazz in India, which we can, uh, which falls into jazz in its historical kind of evolution. A band, a Canadian named Jimmy Lequeem, wound up in Calcutta, which was the capital of India at that time, and at the Grand Hotel recorded the first known jazz recording in India. And what's interesting and important is that there were thousands of these 78s that were made thereafter and which were disseminated. This, it was, wasn't just one or two 
you know, uh, recordings. There were multiple recordings made in the 20s, late 20s and early 30s and distributed on 78s, recorded in Calcutta at Dum Dum, which was the, the, whole, the home of uh, his master's voice and later, I guess, EMI. Uh, but it was zump zump toodle kind of music. So there was something waiting to happen, and the transformation was in 1933 when the first of uh, small groups of African-American musicians who, uh, came to India, and they came to the grand hotels and salons of India, and these were not minor figures. They were important figures in the evolution of jazz. If you get into the some of these jazz encyclopedias and you look at their names, these are seminal original figures, not second-class citizens uh, in, the, in the jazz, uh, uh, you know, pantheon, so to speak. Um, and uh, they stayed in India and they spent time in India, and that's what we're going to talk about. And but we know very little about their lives and their reactions to these extraordinary journeys and their stays. Uh, and uh, by 1947, uh, most if not all had left India. So that's kind of the historical arc of this conversation. So why did they come to India? Well, to start with, as any jazz musician, musician will tell you, money, number one. And as my friend, uh, my respected friend, the late Carlton Quito used to say, free booze, we'll play. Well, it was more than free booze. There was money, India was the jewel in the crown, and the wealth machine of the empire. There's no question about that. And those of you who look at history and uh, are familiar with what was going on in the world, we, I think all of us know that that, that was the case. Um, so there were these grand hotels that were built not just for the Europeans and the Mars, but there were Western educated elite uh, populations in India. And we'll talk a little about that in a second. Uh, I just want to move this out. Right. Uh, and uh, what we saw happening was the development of a huge Western educated middle class. Uh, it's interesting, most of us who are on this, in this forum today, sometimes don't recognize that we are the fourth or fifth generation of English speaking Indians. Uh, granted, we are bilingual and we can understand our mother tongues and everything else, but we go back many generations now, and it all goes back to this character named Macaulay, who basically created this uh, for various reasons, and I won't get into that, this, uh, this Indian educated middle class. And what you see there is an institution that uh, still exists today and which I happen to be an alum, I uh, happen to be, have attended in the 70s, uh, that's in Bombay. That institution was actually founded as a higher education English uh, uh, language uh, institution in the early, in around 1840 or so, and then it transformed and mutated into what it was. But the net result is that with this education, there was the things that come with learning a language, a uh, lot literature, art, theater, architecture, the influences of the language go beyond just speaking. We absorb the culture that the language comes from. And there was, uh, Western music was very compelling. It was different from the sounds that were there. And Western popular music and jazz became more and more prevalent as the popular music of the West. And there was, of course, entertainment in the English language, print theater, hotels, lounges, you know, live shows, etc., etc. And uh, that was the India that brought, uh, attracted these musicians in this amazingly astonishing and rapid transmission of this music. I mean, there is a whole set of work that documents in this pre-internet era how quickly a hit recorded in Chicago was being played in Berlin, Shanghai, Cairo, and Hong Kong. This is amazing. There was no internet, but a hit. And there's this professor the, at Columbia who did this amazing work on actually f capturing the time frame of this transmission. So from France, which had become the hotbed of what was hot jazz and the progenitor of, of this driving syncopated uh, rhythms, uh, the Moulin Rouge, 
there were hundreds of, uh, of African-American musicians who had come there. That's another story. They came in World, uh, World War I with James Reese Europe's band. Uh, the French embraced them, and they became stars, and they lived legendary uh, lives and developed a musical form that is directly the, the springboard for the jazz we know today uh, in many, many ways. Uh, so along with this transmission, we also have this transmission going on in India, not just in the big cities, in the smaller towns as well. And this is a fascinating photograph of some children playing these instruments. But when you see a banjo and a couple of banjos in there, that was the, the instrumentation of the early jazz bands. And here's another amazing photograph from the late 20s or early 30s. And I've shown this to jazz, to historians, jazz historians, and when they look at that drum set, they're called traps, a trap set. That is the early jazz band drummer's drum kit. So there was this music that's being transmitted everywhere. It's going around, taking different forms, mutating, yes, not necessarily the same, but it was moving around. Uh, I want to share with you another piece of wonderful little archival uh, treasure uh, from uh, the mid-30s. And it's about a dance railway at the Railway Institute in Perambur in uh, Chennai, in Madras. And it's got Jake Rosario from Bangalore and his band, which was one of the top bands. But here's what's fascinating about it, and here's the reason why I'm showing it to you. You flip it over and look at what's at the back. The language that describes the musicians is jazz, okay? Uh, uh, moans on tenor, swings, <laughs> uh, slaps that big, can, can swing some stuff on the fiddle, um, slaps that bass. Uh, so there was, along with the music, there was also the, the slang and the language of jazz that was moving around. And this band had been around since 1927 in India. And I think they were Bangalore based, so I think that's appropriate. Uh, 1930, Great Depression hits Europe. Uh, America and the West. Uh, the economic data of the time shows that India was still thriving. India was not really affected by this. And uh, by 1933, France had instituted a law that said only 10% of the musicians playing in France can be foreign born. So musicians had to leave and go somewhere. Guess where they went? Among other places, India. And they were paid salaries that were higher than what they would make in the United States in 1933. So there were good reasons for these musicians to come to India. And of course, that can, the economic driver is paramount. Uh, so they came to India, and there was another reason why they were attractive. The music had kind of develop or had this connotation that it was only real and pure if it was played by African Americans. If it wasn't played by African Americans, it wasn't really jazz. And with this was also this, the racist idea of this primitivism, which did come from Europe in some ways as well, and modernity, and there were these ideas, and Bradley Shope, whose work is amazing, uh, in his thesis many years ago, uh, wrote this, uh, this extract is from his work. And it was seen as the symbol of modernity throughout Asia. Uh, and there were these notions of primitivism, primitiv primitivism and modernity. And they were almost polar opposites uh, in terms of thought. But that's the idea with which it was popularized. And there's a whole other conversation we can have about how Indians absorbed these stereotypes and these racist attitudes uh, that were so prevalent and passed it on for many generations. And hopefully uh, we'll move on, we have moved on from all that. So uh, I just want to make this point uh, because it's an important point uh, and it leads to some of the ideas we're going to share in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, so who were these characters? The most important was a guy named Herb Fleming, but his real name wasn't Herb Fleming. He was also known as Nicolahi El Michel. And we don't really know 
whether he really was Nikolai El Michel or whether he was really Herb Fleming or which name came first. But he had this amazing group of musicians called the International Rhythm Aces. And they were not international because they came from Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Staten Island, and New Jersey. These were really international musicians. He had a, a drummer, Cuban drummer. He had a piano player from Latin America. And they created a very hot sound. And, when, and he had been touring the world from 1922, absorbing these sounds and bringing these sounds to the West. And he was an innovator. And Herb Fleming's music, when you compared it with the toodle zoom zoom stuff that Jimmy Laquim and these guys recorded at the Grand Hotel, which you can see behind me, that's the visual, uh, my background visual, Grand Hotel Calcutta. This music was diametrically different. And it also was played by musicians of the appropriate color, uh, which we just talked about as being very important. So night after night, Herb Fleming and the International uh, Rhythm Aces come to India and they play packed house for almost six months in 1930, six or eight months actually, close to that. Uh, this is the poster for uh, one of those events at the Grand Hotel. If you can see they use the word hogmane, which I don't even know what that really means, but uh, uh, maybe someone can tell me what it really means. But whatever it was, it went with the language of, of jazz. and. Uh, if you look at uh, on the right, uh, on, it says tonight, it says, look where he's been playing, New York, Paris, Buenos Aires, the most fashionable continental resorts. This was a major band, not second rate, second class characters. Okay, and we'll, we can talk about that a little later. So there he is, he gets brought to India, gets uh, shipped, uh, come, travels by sea, comes to India, has a residency. But in this band, he has three or four characters who play pivotal roles and who we're going to be talking about a little more. Roy Butler on saxophone, Luis Pedroso uh, on drums from Cuba, and uh, Cricket Smith on trumpet. Uh, these names, these are not lightweight musicians, as I've said before, they matter. Uh, Cricket Smith could hold his own with Louis Armstrong. Uh, he was out there. Luis uh, Pedroso, the drummer, brought rhythms and syncopations that were hot because of his Cuban background, changed the music. And Roy Butler was, uh, who's uh, actually playing a clarinet in this picture, in this photograph, was probably one of the world's top sidemen in demand to make the band sound good and also credited with being among the early innovators of making the saxophone a lead instrument and taking it out of the Dixieland, uh, you know, multi-instrumentalist kind of sound. But that's another story. So we have Nikolai here, Michel, Herb Fleming, he stayed almost uh, a year. Cricket Smith, the trumpet player, uh, stayed in India from 1933 to 1943 and died in Bombay. Roy Butler uh, lived in India from 1933 to 1944. And then we have two other characters who, are very, uh, who played their part too. This dapper, dazzling, debonair uh, band leader named Leon Abbey, who made not just one trip to India, but two trips to India. He had two contracts and brought with him the next round of, of hot musicians, the latest musicians from, uh, from uh, the Club Alabama in New York and from Paris uh, as well. And Bill Coleman, who you see in the dark suit in this photograph, along with these other guys. This is a very uh, important photograph because it commemorates the arrival of Bill Col of Leon Abbey on his second trip, and he brings with him Bill Coleman, who, again, you can look him up. Uh, Bill Coleman uh, continued as a super musician uh, for many years, uh, and Bill Coleman stayed in India for six months. And then we have. Teddy Weatherford, the piano demon, who was legendary. He had been traveling and playing in Asia from 1927. Uh, he played in Shanghai till 1935. 1935, he comes to India and then lives in India till 1945, and he dies in Calcutta. But it's these characters that are our source of information uh, for this talk. Unfortunately, uh, 
none of them were great writers or literateurs or they were musicians they were focused on their work they played rehearsals uh, but we have some material that we can share uh, uh, as their perspective uh, so that's so let's get into that uh, 1934 these three characters, Roy Butler, Creighton uh, Thomas, Chris Cricketsmith, uh, Luis Pedroso, they land up at the Taj Mahal. These were originary music. And what they did is they basically spread this music. They went from being members of a band to then becoming leaders of their own bands. And in the process, finding local musicians wherever they could, training them and spreading this music into small towns and uh, all sorts of interesting places. Uh, what's interesting is this is an extract from Bradley Shope's work and it's called They Treat Us White Folks Fine. And that is a quote from Teddy Weatherford who was asked how he was doing in India and his answer was they treat us white folks fine. I think that says a lot about how they perceived themselves when they were in India. Uh, but let's learn a little more about that. Uh, this is Cricket Smith and his band, uh, another of hundreds of photographs that I, I find in my archives. And of course, Naresh Fernandez and others have also uh, done wonderful work. Uh, Naresh's book is a must read if you haven't read it. But let me not digress. So the perspective, let's get to the heart of this. So what was the perspective of these musicians? It was exotic, almost forbidden, and uh, Brad wants a show uh, from his uh, essay on uh, South Asian popular culture. He describes this poster of, of Teddy Weatherford. He's an African-American man, a dignified man, who's now made to look like a minstrel and look appealing because it fits the popular perspective a perception of what a black or African-American man should look like. So this is from the Taj. It's a poster uh, that was used to promote his band. And uh, basically, the marketing publicity, the branding, was set up to make these musicians primitive yet exotic. At the same time, they are being applauded and lauded and uh, worshipped in some cases for their modernity and the sound they were bringing. So these views spread into the Indian mindset. This is the, the Indians who followed this music. And there were hundreds of Indians who were listening to this. And the racial stereotypes that came with this, unfortunately, got passed on. And I have conversations I've had with older uh, Indians who are now gone, uh, who remember uh, this music from this, this era, and the words and the language they use to describe these performers fits that same appalling uh, racial stereotype, but that's the way it was. Uh, it wasn't right, but that's what was absorbed into the Indian mindset as well. And we can't hide it. It's what it was. So there was this polar kind of view and that branding and marketing and imaging continued for years and years. I mean, look at the 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 the, the, the poster for the showboat dance uh, with the plantation quartet. That's what Teddy Weatherford's band was named, not by Teddy Weatherford, but by the marketing people at the hotels, right? The plantation quartet. And they actually performed in blackface, which is disgusting. And, you know, it sickens me. But this is what was what how this music was spread and popularized. And were they well paid for it? Yeah, they took the money. They were happy with the money, and they did what was, I guess, expected of them. Um, here are a couple more images of Teddy Weatherford, the great Teddy Weatherford. I don't have to say anything more. I'll just let you look at them. Uh, this is a musician who was considered, if you know how you form these uh, all-star bands on paper, 
he would be the piano player and I have documented evidence of an all-star band lineup that somebody that was put together in Chicago you know, on paper and it had Teddy Weatherford on piano you know and this is how he was depicted so this continued and I hear a few more images from marketing materials and publicity and uh, these were dignified intelligent musicians playing an intelligent dignified music who were made to look like this in the images that were put forward this was the colonial viewpoint this was the the racism that was pre pre prevalent and it came to India as well we can't hide that we can't run away from that so there he is Teddy Weatherford and his band they're called the boys if he was a white man and, it were, and his band they wouldn't be called the boys they'd be the gentlemen of jazz these guys were the boys okay so that's what it was and that's the way it was but I'll end this on an interesting note here is a uh, a dinner menu and you can see at the same time the boys there is a dish called poir glass weatherford named after teddy weatherford on the same menu is another dish named after Cecil Rhodes, the biggest imperialist, racist <laughs> there ever was, and white supremacist. On the same menu, there's a dish uh, named after him, and there's one with, uh, with Teddy Weatherford on the same menu. Go figure. I, I think that's uh, an interesting uh, juxtaposition, and I don't think it was intended. Uh, so. So let me uh, quickly give you, shift now to the heart of the story, which is how did these musicians perceive India? What was India for them? So let me run this uh, for you and hopefully An expansion came about when one Prince David of East India, he offered here at the Grand Hotel of Calcutta, India, together with my band. Again, I was aboard a ship going to a strange land of people whom I later found to be fond lovers of jazz music. Claim and dignity had been accorded us on many an occasion, but the reception I afforded me and my staff was much to be many times remembered. We were taken to a newly constructed apartment building owned by the Grand Hotel where the best was provided and a staff of servants to our every want. Two cooks, two table servants, one coolie for cleaning, two Gurkha guardsmen and an individual servant for each member. Okay, that's an extract from uh, the film I, I made uh, a few years ago. But we can get deeper into the minds of these musicians from some of their own work. But let's start with what I believe is important. You know, I always say that every picture tells a story. And here are a few photographs. That's Cricket Smith. Uh, and it's a smiling, happy Cricket Smith. Very, very comfortable in India. Uh, with an interracial group of people standing next to Cricket in the second photograph is the legendary Mickey Correa who became a band leader, a well-known band leader for many, many years. And uh, once again, here's Cricket. The point of this is that these are smiling, comfortable musicians in India. And we have a written extract uh, which I'll share with you from one of the other musicians who came, one of the characters I mentioned early. And he says, I wouldn't have missed the opportunity of going to India even if my agent had offered me five times the salary I had. He had such an amazing experience. And this is one of the few written, um, uh, I guess, statements we have about uh, what people saw and felt as musicians in India. But the next uh, little quote here is very, very significant. He says, while taking his afternoon siesta, he would hear some Indian music on someone's gramophone. It was great music. They had their type of jazz, which included fine soloists on instruments, the names of which I do not know, and favorite singers. I suppose if I had been an arranger, I would have taken more interest in Indian music. I'm sorry I did not buy any instrument. This is 1937 or 38, way before 
there was Indo Jazz Fusion or anything like that. There's the very talented Bill Coleman from his book, The Trumpet Story, uh, which is his memoirs, uh, writing about listening to this music. So it tells us a lot about how guys like Bill Coleman were reacting to India. Bill Coleman was there with his wife, as many of the musicians did, their contracts allowed them to do that. And there's a, a story that many of us may know about, about Bill Coleman being told by one of his musicians that his wife was called a stinking uh, rhymes with witch by somebody at the bar. Bill Coleman gets up, slugs the guy. It turns out he's just hit the American, the United States vice consul and slugged him and decked him. And nothing happens to Bill Coleman, he gets reprimanded. If that was the United States, Bill Coleman would have been locked up in jail, probably lynched or whatever they did back in those days. But that tells you how these musicians were regarded and this complete diametric lifestyle and world they were living in. And there's other stories that go with it. Uh, again, I wanna make sure I stay on time here. Ken, do I have a few minutes more? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll keep this running and I hope uh, you, you all find it interesting as we keep going. So the other person, and this is the last person we're gonna talk about, is Roy Butler, we mentioned him. Roy Butler was very different. He was an archivist, he was a documentarian. His scrapbooks and his collection of artifacts, he didn't write a lot, but what he collected was amazing, and they're all sitting in the Roy Butler archives in the Chicago, uh, the public library uh, in Chicago. And what's interesting is this guy, Roy Butler, was an internationalist. You can't read that because that's a little blurred, but his below his photograph, it says Chicago, New York, Paris, Zurich, Leipzig, Hamburg, Paris, uh, Bremen, Nuremberg, uh, Grenoble, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Antwerp, Brussels, Milan, Venice, uh, Turin, Naples, uh, my gosh, it goes on, Sevilla, Madrid, Palma, Lisboa, Gibraltar, Buenos Aires, Calcutta, Bombay, Surabaya, Java, right? Uh, uh, Batavia, and Singapore. Here's this guy, this amazing, well-traveled musician. He's seen the world, and here he is uh, in India, and he's collecting, he continues to collect material and his collection is amazing. Uh, this is important. Again, it gives you a perspective on how they saw India. This is one of his contracts. It confirms that he's going to get a salary of 400 rupees a month. Uh, I did a little research on what a rupee was worth in 1937, and apparently it was 2.68 US dollars. That was a lot of money. That was his monthly salary. But. Roy Butler also, as I said, he was an archivist. That is his liquor permit. That is the permit that allows him to drink alcohol in Bombay in 1937. And obviously this mattered to him, so he saved it in his scrapbook and he brought it back. I'm sorry, this is 1940. But some things don't change. So there he is, is his liquor permit. And this is uh, a poster from an event in Missouri. That's where the Trocadero was. Apparently there was this grand uh, show place called the Trocadero and you can see all the concerts that are going on out there and the Rhythm Aces with Roy Butler are out there uh, playing there. So Roy Butler's work is very important to us because it's one of the few archival collections that uh, were preserved from that time. Uh, here's another thing from his scrapbook. Louis Armstrong says, best wishes, another very fine musician, Louis Armstrong. That's Louis Armstrong saying, Roy Butler, you're, you're a musician, you're a jazz musician. I mean, and here's a, a little a photograph, you know. Um, this one is an important picture because this is towards the end of his career in India, but to the right you see the name Meli Metha who happens to be the father of a very well-known musician. But Melly Metha was playing jazz. He had a sextet, you know, uh, back in the day. And there he is, uh, you know, at the Harbour Bar or wherever, playing uh, at the Greens Hotel, which was also owned by the Taj. Again, Roy Butler capturing his stuff, telling you, giving us information on what was going on, what he saw as a musician 
Clearly, the, these musicians mattered to him. He wrote letters to his mother from all over the world. He sent them by airmail, which was not cheap back in the day. His airmail and uh, his letters to his mother are usually very brief. And they're usually the kind of letters a son writes to his mom. Everything's okay, mom, don't worry. I'm sending you some money. Do you need money? Because remember, things weren't easy back there. But I've underlined and highlighted an important line from here. Uh, I arrived safely back in India, etc., etc. But everything's okay, but because we are so well known here and also know some very big people. So that's the stature and the relationship these musicians had that allowed Roy Butler to send this note or uh, encouraged him to send this letter saying, we know big people, we're okay. You know, we're not lowly musicians, you know, scuttling around in the Chitlin circuit back home. You know. uh, and here are some of the photographs that were in the film that basically give reveal uh, Roy Butler's viewpoints. He, he was also a photographer, uh, among other things. And his photographs we're going to see a little later on as we wrap up. He also was a cartoonist. He drew sketches. And uh, this one's an interesting one. It's basically a musician's perspective. Finish your work, and he says the road that leads home at the bottom, and it says to the bar. That's where musicians go after their gig. And at the back it says Silver Slipper. You probably meant the Golden Slipper in Calcutta, which used to be an after-hours place for the musicians after they finished up. Uh, and they would go there and they would play late into the, into the early hours of the morning. Uh, from the archives of Roy Butler and uh, uh, his photographs. There won't be time for me, so please wrap it up now. Yeah, I'm just gonna wrap. So we have photographs and with the photographs, we have a documentarian view of India and what he was seeing. They aren't just photographs of uh, him playing with his band. He annotates the photographs very carefully and the reverse of every photograph, including the one of the Dudwala over here at the bottom there, he's made his notes about what he's seen and sometimes he has comments about uh, how they're different. You know, three wheeler very different from the ones we have. It burns kerosene, uh, times haven't changed much over here, etc., etc. But that's what he did. So he brought this perspective and the net of it is he came away from India, as many of them did, with this experience of having been treated very, very well and treated in a way that they wouldn't be treated anywhere else. Uh, this photograph is also from his archives. It's from an, a private a little gathering of friends here. But he says, a cross-section of the people that make Bombay a very cosmopolitan city. In this group are Americans, Anglo-Indians, English, Indians, Swedes, Dutch, Malays, Philippines, Germans, and French. So that is the society they moved in uh, when they, when the great Teddy Weather, Weatherford passed away. Uh, he's, he was noted in the newspaper and the Defender, which was the great African-American paper out of Chicago, wrote a whole obituary about him and called him the Count Basie of the Far East and called him a famed pianist who died in India. So I hope this has shed some light on these musicians and how they saw India and what uh, what, uh, how India saw them. Uh, they went on, they vanished, they went away, they got replaced by Indian musicians. Uh, Kawas Katal, Rudy Cotton, who was a very interesting character, that's another story. And of course the music changed and it went from the swing era to bop, and here are musicians in the early 40s and 50s reflecting the changes around them. Uh, but there were vast numbers of these musicians. These guys, remember, they formed their own bands, they trained musicians, they brought new musicians in, and here's a photograph from Bombay in the early, late 40s, early 50s. You have four tenors, six altos, two baritones, two basses. Where did all these guys go? Where did the music go? And I, the I answer is very we... simple. The clubs died, and that's where they went. And Bollywood, and the music of Bollywood, was propelled, enhanced, and made what it is by these jazz musicians. So, Shio, wrap, this wrap it up at this point. Work. Sorry? Wrap it up at this point, because there isn't going to be time for the other presentation. Yeah, I'll just take another second. Thank you. So that's pretty much it. Uh, this is where the music went. The music lives on in various forms. 
uh, when we listen to this music today, it's not what we think is jazz, but it's all there. The roots are there. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip this. Uh, this work was all made possible by this wonderful person named Jahangir Dalal, who was a fabulous archivist. Here he is with Sonny Rollins. And if it wasn't for Jahangir, a lot of these photographs would not have been collected, and a lot of these materials would not have been collected. Uh, with I think, that, I, think, I, I want to thank that's... you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm going to try to go quickly uh, through my presentation because of the time. Uh, basically, Sushilo has brilliantly showed you how Blacks were associated with both modernity and primitivism. Very often, this uh, Black music was associated with extremes in societal modes, the religious, the spirituals, the gospel music, and the life of, uh, of openness uh, to alcohol and drugs and sex and so on and so forth. But I want to focus on the spiritual aspects of this and take you through two particular musicians. One is a Sufi named Hazrat Anayat Khan, and the other is John Coltrane and his uh, jazz musician and his wife, Alice. Uh, John and Alice were very important jazz musicians. Uh, John Coltrane is one of the two or three, three greatest jazz saxophonists of all time. And his wife, Alice, actually became a Hindu guru following her career as a jazz musician, pianist, and harpist. At the time that uh, they were prominent, uh, it was a time of political liberation, and the music reflected that. There was a lot of anger shown and so on and so forth. And it was shown in the music itself. But there had always been a spiritual thing and many of the musicians were influenced by, by, uh, by Islam in various forms. Uh, from the earliest days of the Ahmadiyya movement, uh, they sent missionaries like Mufti Muhammad Sadiq to America and they uh, were involved in the uh, jazz community and some great jazz musicians including Yosef Latif, uh, became adherents of the Ahmadiyyas. But other sorts of uh, forms of Islam also attracted jazz musicians, many of whom took Muslim names. There was also a sense of spiritual liberation that drove jazz musicians to uh, India. Here we have the great saxophonist Sonny Rollins in India with a person that uh, Sushil mentioned, uh, who uh, was uh, Jahangir Dalal, who was uh, very, 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 still is very knowledgeable about jazz musician. But Sonny Rollins didn't play jazz music, but he was a spiritual meditator and so on and so forth. Many of the jazz musicians were influenced by the counterculture of the 1960s and helped to form it. And so you had jazz musicians performing music for yoga meditation and so on and so forth. And, and that sort of thing. One of the most multicultural musicians was Don Cherry. So when, when I was growing up in the 1960s, all of a sudden musicians everywhere were discovering Indian music. Uh, classical musicians like Yehudi Menuhin uh, emphasized the virtuosity and discipline of Indian music and rock musicians emphasized with the alternate spirituality and they associated India with taking drugs, which drove Ravi Shankar nuts. And they associated um, the music, uh, Indian music with improvisational freedom. The jazz musician alone identified with all of these things across the board. There were quite a number of important jazz musicians who played with Indian musicians. Uh, one of the most important uh, was Ali Akbar Khan, who to me is, he with Valayat Khan, I guess, or, two of my absolute favorite Indian musicians. And he played with another one of my favorite jazz musicians, John Handy. And they produced some sort of Indo jazz, quote, fusion music. But what I want to talk to you about is something that goes outside of this sort of thing. Take you back to my other work, uh, which is on Maharajas. And one of my favorite Maharajas was a village boy who became uh, Maharaja Sayaji Rao III. He was a patron of, of all sorts of arts and nationalism and so on and so forth. And in my mind, in his 
his creation of Baroda as a cultured city. He sought the services of indigenous visionaries and creative people. He had them broaden their vision by cross-referencing all sorts of religious, literary, performing, visual arts. Uh, he, I mean, if you look at some of the people who he encouraged, you have Ambedkar, you have Aurobindo, you have uh, Anayat Khan, who I'm talking about, who is both a musician and a great Sufi as well. And he saw India as developing and being an alternate center for development in, of modernization, not by destroying traditions, by retrieving and upgrading traditions and his patronage of great innovative thinkers. So he helped create a, a sustained creative network uh, and a frame of mind which influenced many into the 21st century. This was especially true in music, where some of the greatest Indian musician like Fayez Khan were patronized by him. He had this wonderful All India Music Conference in 1916, and he supported several generations of great musicians uh, who, uh, even in one family, there was Mullah Box, his son, and his grandson was Hazrat Anayat Khan. So, who was this Hazrat Anayat Khan? He was uh, under the aegis of Sayaji Rao, he helped form classical works on Indian music theory and practice. Uh, he wrote that Sayaji Rao was a patriot uh, and he started all sorts of things. And he saw Sayaji Rao as somebody who created the idea, uh, supported the idea that there's one spirit of truth and one truth behind all ideas. Hazrat Nayad Khan came to the West as a musician. He accompanied leading dancers like Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean. And you see Ted Sean on the right here, posing as Shiva in a dance of bliss, which supposedly creates, sustains, and destroys the universe and is a source of all life, uh, momentum, movement, and rhythm. Nayad Khan became known as the peer of dancers of universal peace, and he founded what he called the International Sufi Movement. One of the things that influenced many jazz musicians, ranging from Yosef Latif, who I mentioned before, to John Coltrane, was Anayat Khan's idea of the sound universe. Now, he had no connection with jazz. At the time that he came, he saw jazz as a music that catered to people's sensuality, uh, need for instant gratification, drugs, and so on and so forth. He did not live to see the spiritual element of jazz take hold in the way that it did. But his concept of this sound universe influenced many jazz musicians. He saw music as the language of the soul, something which could unite nations and races. And he quoted from various scripture in the Bible. First was the word and the word was God. Uh, and in the Quran, he said that the word was pronounced and all creation became manifest. And he saw the origin of all creation as sound and that rhythm is the basic nature of human and uh, universal construction and constitution. And again, he saw all things and beings as proclaiming in the name of God, every activity of life expressing the sound, the word mentioned in the Bible before existing before the light came into being. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God, was with God, and was God. He saw, saw this as something that was audible to Christ, to Shiva, and he saw the flute of Krishna as symbolic of the same sound. He saw this as the sound that Muhammad heard in the cave when he became lost in his contemplation, and the sound that Moses heard on Mount Sinai when he communed with God and being given 
<clears throat> the Ten Commandments. So in his book, The Smithism Sound, he saw music and not theology or holy books as being the underpinning of authentic religious thought. He saw true religious divine messages in terms of the Psalms of David, the Song of Solomon, the Gita of, of Krishna, and so on and so forth. And he saw this as promoting an ideal that someday <clears throat> music and its philosophy will become the religion of all humanity. He wrote to attain spirituality is to realize the whole university is, uh, you know, one symphony. And every individual is one note. In the same vein, John Coltrane, one of his pieces, Ohm, which he saw as meaning the first vibration, the word from which all men and everything else comes, the primal word, the word of power. So he was playing in secular settings in the iconic village Vanguard, where I spent, wasted a lot of my youth, which is a, uh, an oddly shaped basement with uncomfortable chairs, but is a temple to uh, jazz music. Ravi Shankar too said that sound is God. And he spoke of this in, in terms of uh, becoming the Raga himself. But Ravi Shankar and John Coltrane were not collaborators, but their, their music emphasized a number of different similarities, modality, drone like pedal points and so on and so forth. But it was the spiritual quest that was part of this. And even today, their performance of Coltrane's music, many years after his death, using rugs as part of this, performing his uh, great music using rugs. In 1957, Coltrane experienced a spiritual awakening. And he was involved at, from this point on in an obsessional search. At first, it took the idea of on a single saxophone, he could play multiple notes at the same time. And he could play every note, every chord, every chord on chord uh, simultaneously. And then it fell away to a more modal sort of thinking, freeing, freeing himself up. And this cultivated in his masterpiece called A Love Supreme, an acknowledgement of God and pursuance of God. He was determined to reach the divine. Now, if you look at the history of mystics in general, you find that many mystics, having reached such a peak experience, then go into a dark night of the soul where they feel totally alone in the absence of Godhead. You see this in all religions. The classical example is in Christianity, St. John of the Cross. Uh, but Coltrane was willing to seek and face a unknowable divine without any guideposts. In other words, taking us beyond a resolution that we would be one with God to a sense of what that would be, keeping us in the maelstrom. He had moved from creating sheets of sound with rapid 16th notes to overwhelmingly intense dissonant walls of sound to almost speaking in tongues like we have in the Pentecostal church and driving some closer and closer to higher levels of consciousness and not being afraid of the presence of the divine. In his works like Om, he incorporates verses from the Gita, indicating everything is a manifestation of the absolute. According to Bhagavad Gita, experience this Varupa, the true form of God, can be totally overwhelming, even to those who crave it. And I showed you a painting from my collection talking about Arjuna's experience of the overwhelming nature of God, but he wasn't afraid. After his sudden death at an early age, his wife took to Hindu spirituality uh, and her records became more and more ethereal. And she produced records like Journey into Sasha Dananda. 
and became a guru in her own right. And she interpreted various bhajans uh, and incorporating a black American gospel-like feel at times, such as doing things like clapping on beats two and four and having organ playing gospel chord progressions and voices and, and so on and so forth. There's a long history of African-Americans expressing solidarity with Indians, countering colonial and post-colonial racist and orientalist narratives. It's difficult to say to which say extent Coltrane's engagements may have been politically motivated. And if you try to do this, I don't think it really bears out. But Alice Coltrane's adaptions of Bajans helped her and the African-American members of her ashram, there were some white members as well, to experience a sense of bhakti in a more personal sense. But this idea of the long history of relationships between African-Americans and uh, Indians can be seen in the importance of, um, of, the, of people like Paul Robeson, and um, who symbolized many Indian leaders, the aspirations of oppressed people. And when he sang his signature song, Old Man Riven, just think of some of the invocations to the Ganges and the Brahmaputra River in dealing with the rivers in sense, in, in difference to the sufferings of others who lived on its banks. Paul Robeson was so important that every day, every week when he visited his wife's grave, Muhammad Ali Jinnah sang Robeson's The End of a Perfect Day. On Indian Independence Day, the Anglo-Indian band leader, Ken Mack, flew from Bombay to Karachi to toast Jinnah with that song. And this shows us how music can bring together people from all ways. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Or? Hi, yes, we have a question for Sushil in the Q&A box uh, from Nisha. And she asks, uh, who were the first people to embrace jazz in India? Were they women, lower castes, or small towners? How was it received in Bollywood? How did this muse merge or translate with the existing traditions in India? Uh, Kenneth or Sushil, would you like to take that question? Uh yeah, I'm happy to try to answer it. And first, let me say, Nisha, that's a, a thank you very much for your question, and thank you for thinking this was interesting. Um, you know, I wish I knew the answer who the first people were, but uh, in terms of what I think it was in the large cities, but specifically, there were women and small towners too, uh, because of. Uh, the spread through gramophone records and also radio, shortwave radio, which was picked up in all sorts of smaller places, yes. In terms of caste orientation, all I know is that many of the early musicians who played this music were Goans and came from Goa, and they were from what was considered a lower caste because they came from a particular group of people. This is anecdotal. I don't have anything more than that. Uh, in terms of women, we do have uh, more than a few women who were prominent jazz musicians. Uh, the most well-known was Lucille Pacheco, who was a band leader and had her own, uh, was a saxophone player, among other things. But I wish I knew more and I could answer that. <laughs> I hope that helps. We, we do have this problem of uh, researching things. Uh, it's sometimes better to go within a tradition and you get to see things. Uh, for example, uh, Narish Chandra, uh, Narish Fernandez uh, has uh, put, put up this book, 
the uh, Taj Mahal Tango. And of Fox course, this was Fox Trap. And that was, uh, wasn't that composed by a Baghdadi Jew? Yes, but he wasn't, uh, uh, he, his name was Mena Silas. But I don't think you, they were among the first people to, at least I'm looking at Nisha's question. I'm not right, sure right. how that relates right. to that. But yeah. I, I think, that, I think that my point really is, is that if you look at these things, you find that many times, and if you look at the movies too, you see a lot of the early actresses were not Hindus. Uh, there were Jews, there were Goanese, uh, like uh, Ermeline and so on and so forth. And so just like Jasmine has come to represent America, that didn't come from the dominant group either. And uh, an Indian, uh, you know, picking up jazz. Um, and it isn't even, even if you try to make these things, I mean, like you, we, I think the Goanese have been the, you know, produced a large number of jazz musicians, but your fellow Carlton uh, was not Goanese, for example. Yeah, he was. Uh, his name was Kavas Khatab. But I think uh, Nisha's question also, if I'm not wrong, also looks at the listeners who was listening to this thing because embracing jazz just doesn't mean playing it. You know, there's many of us who love jazz and embrace it without playing it. Uh, there's another part of her question, which is how it was received in Bollywood. And Nisha, if you're interested in that, that's a, a whole story by itself. The short version is that the films of India with the arrival of sound and the talkies transformed uh, uh, not only the, the, the kind of music that was being played, but the, the style of the film as well. And there was a whole period right after independence where almost every Bollywood film from the late of the early 50s has a Western scene because there was this whole idea of the West and there was this Western, this kid who came from a village who falls into this trap, goes to a cabaret and Helen's dancing, blah, blah, blah. But there's always a jazz band playing there. And the songs and the compositions were very much a part of every Bollywood film. I've done a whole talk with about 40 examples of jazz tunes literally copied over into Bollywood films in the 50s. And uh, that's where these musicians went, and they're the ones who contributed to them. They'd be told, hey, now we need some Western, some jazzy stuff. So one of these jazz musicians who used to play at the Taj would <laughs> come up with the melody and arrange it, and that's the way it worked. Uh, it's, it's a much longer conversation about, uh, specifically about how this music morphed into Bollywood, but uh, it did merge and it did morph, and the short answer to the morphing is you'll hear many a Bollywood tune where the first part is a dhun, a pahadi dhun, right? And the second part is a jazz piece, and then it goes back to a pahadi dhun or some uh, folk music from India. So they did merge and they did morph, and you can hear it uh, in all that music from the 50s and 60s particularly. Does the uh, questioner have any information herself that you'd like to share with us? Um, there is one more question. Um, so, Bear Rose says, um, Ken, who was the guru with whom Alice Coltrane worked with? Do I understand that she incorporated Inayat Khan's philosophy and Hindu philosophy in her music? And Sushil, where and how can one obtain the film Finding Carlton? His is the most important uh, question, so let him go first. Uh, the, the film is currently, for various reasons, I could only get academic licensing, which meant that this could not be put out because I'm using music uh, that was copyrighted uh, tunes, among other things. It was very complicated. So, But the film is in 110 university libraries. In India, I know there are copies at the uh, Film Institute and in Bombay with a couple places, the, in Calcutta. Uh, if you want to just send me an email, I'll send you a link, you can watch it. <laughs> but I haven't been able to really commercialize, quote unquote, this film because of these, some of these copyright reasons I'm hoping to. Uh, it's very expensive just to get the academic licensing was hard enough, you know. 
this is a pretty much a crowdfunded film. This was not produced by any studios, and uh, it was really produced by wonderful people in India and all over the world. You know, so uh, hey, do send me an email, and I'm happy to, to send you a link. Yeah, but Rose is a terrific filmmaker in her own right, and her works on the CDs in particular are world renowned. Um, in terms of her question, um, I think the 1960s were a period where things were very fluid and people took influences a little bit from here and a little bit from there. And so it was not unusual for somebody to take something from Anayat Khan and have nothing to do with Anayat Khan and just move into a totally different uh, sort of religious background. The, this comes from an idea that there, there are two types of religion. There's uh, these formal religions that uh, like uh, Islam or Christianity. And then there is this the other uh, religions uh, or religious practices like Sufism or, uh, or Hinduism, which is, was, was seen at that time by many people as being a very free sort of thing, was totally dissociated from American uh, from uh, Indian realities. And um, so it was possible for somebody to become, to completely redefine themselves uh, by taking on an Indian identity. And so many blacks, as we saw um, in, in our work, took on very different names and identities as time went on, as they tried to find their roots. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you, um, Sushil and Kenneth, for those um, fascinating insights into you know, a part of history which we're not very aware of. And um, it's great to see the connections that have been made through music in, in such diverse, people coming from such diverse uh, parts of the world. Um, um, yeah, so I think with that, we can wrap up today's session. Thank you all for attending. And I'd just like to remind you that there will be, this was the second in the series with Kenneth Robbins, and there will be another one coming up next Thursday. So please do join us for that as well. And we look forward to seeing you again in another series of BIC streams. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to thank BIC. You. Thanks very much for hosting this. Appreciate it. It's nice to be back with uh, BIC again, uh, although it's a different location, I believe. Thank you. Thank you.